Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here today to provide a perspective from your most junior members, the medical students, and I'm here to deliver two messages from them. And the first one is a very reassuring message, and that's that interest and participation in medical leadership and management is alive and kicking amongst students. And we've seen a huge increase in the number of resources available for medical students, and this has created a very diverse landscape of opportunities. And for many students, society set up at medical schools or universities are their first port of call. And for interested students, they can go on to do an intercalated BSc in management at organisations such as Imperial or King's. And for practical experience, others benefit from an enthusiastic consultant who can support them through an audit or a quality improvement project. And there are lots of external organisations in this space as well. So there's Lead-In, which is a great student-led society in London, and that provides great events and resources. And there's also the Social Enterprise Diagnosis, who provide internship opportunities. And we know that medical electives are starting to be offered at some of the larger private sector organisations as well. But there are two challenges with the opportunities that I've presented to you. And the first of these is that the opportunities are really fragmented. And I think that's where the FMLM fits in because actually it's in a very privileged position to be able to match interested individuals with the opportunities that are already available. But the second challenge is more difficult, and this is where I want your help, because currently the opportunities are only really available to medical students who already have an interest in medical leadership and management, rather than to everybody. And that leads me on to my second message. And this is that we've yet to make the development of medical leadership and management skills a core part of the medical school experience. And this is why I think it's important. Because the science of medicine as taught at medical school is inseparable from the practical reality of delivering it in the system of the NHS. Students are taught that the two are separate, but they're not. And frustrations with one therefore unhelpfully impact upon the other. And we could consider this disconnect our very own version of CP Snow's two cultures. Because as job interviews go, joining the NHS as an F1 is pretty long and arduous. I can't think of another employer who sets standards for what you need at GCSE and then interview you for six years. And yet we accept FY1 doctors with limited formal training about the structure of the system that they're going to be spending their career practicing in. And that limits their understanding of the historical, the population, the financial and the political context and the constraints of what is, after all, the world's fifth largest employer. And information instead for medical students is an amalgamation of public health lectures, of the apprenticeship that they spend during their clinical years in the NHS, of quips and sound bites from consultants, and from opinion that's often really negative from the media. And I think the results of this are threefold, all of which I would argue disadvantage the service and our patients. So firstly, frustration amongst students that the system limits practicing the kind of medicine that they've learnt at medical school. Secondly, the expertise in leadership and management gained as a junior doctor risks being lost if enthusiastic people leave the service. And thirdly, that medical management and leadership skills risk being marginalised into an additional rather than a core skill set. And that's a shame because it's a really good way of influencing and shaping the system that we're practising in to benefit the patients. So, how do we make the most of balancing this enthusiasm that we have with this disconnect between medical science and healthcare delivery? And how do we do this for the majority rather than for the limited few? I think that, for me, is the key point. Well, I would argue that the solution is to start really early by making it an integral part of the medical school experience. And I think that's going to allow us to develop graduates with an understanding of the context and the limitations of the system. And also, and this is the really important bit, the confidence and the skills to be able to engage with providing the best kind of patient care. And we hope to be able to provide a starting point for some of this through some key themes to our work. And the first of those is engagement, and this is you in the room here. So our aim is that all medical schools have chief executives, medical directors, consultants and trainees talking to their medical students about the context in which they're working and about their own management and leadership experiences. And the second is education. So our curriculum project has identified that there's real variation in the uptake of the medical leadership competency framework amongst medical, uh, amongst medical schools. And we're aiming to bridge the gap by developing an NHS guide that briefly uh, outlines what the structure and context of the NHS is for medical students, and also via our online learning leadership resources. 
And the third is development. So we'd like all medical students to have the opportunity to practice their newfound knowledge and skills in a safe to fail environment. So that might be via special study modules, external projects, internships. And we're developing the networks to support this. So via a project and uh, experience network, via, via a professional development scheme that's run by the trainees that provides quarterly face-to-face -face, uh, skills development, and also by a mentoring scheme, also run by the trainees for the students. And I wanted to finish by making one request of you. Change amongst medical students is only going to be possible if it comes down from you, the senior leaders of our medical schools and hospitals. So as you leave this conference full of enthusiasm for the future of NHS leadership and management, please impart this to your juniors and to your students when you get back. Be honest with them about what works and what doesn't, and use this as a basis for a conversation with them about what could be done differently. And that's going to allow us, in turn, to support and to carry on all of the great work that you're doing. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. A call to action there for everybody to put in their to-do list. If we can go straight on now to the view of the trainees with Lola Lorenthal, who will talk about um, that perspective. Thank you. So, I hope you're all enjoying the conference. I found it fa fascinating and really helpful. And I think over the last few days, you've heard a lot about the importance of leadership and what makes a good leader. Yet I think many trainees and medical students do not see themselves as leadership leaders or actually possessing those skills and leadership qualities that are needed in everyday practice. I've just taken a year out to be a National Medical Director's Clinical Fellow at the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management and learn about leadership and gain experience in how to become a better leader myself. Yet it was on returning to clinical medicine that I've become acutely aware how we are all leaders, whatever level. And that goes from my foundation year one trainee who on my firm to who, who guides and inspires the medical students and shows them how they are going to become the best doctors they can be, to my core medical trainee year one who looks to me for influence, inspiration on how they can be a, not only a better doctor but also get those all-rounded skills that we've heard about today, and to, to myself who will look to the consultants and the wider medical team, and that's just within our firm. You then move on to the nurses and the wider hospital, and it's, we are all leaders in our own right and all having to demonstrate those leadership behaviours. Um, we know from Michael West's work that effective teams deliver the best patient care and that appreciation drives good teamwork. But it's not until you see that glow on your foundation near one's face when you go and thank them for their really hard work on helping to sort out that sick patient, explaining how they made a difference in that care, that it drives home. And I think we've really got to see that as we, go, as we walk around the wards and make sure that we appreciate our teams in those ways. And there was a quote at the Education Day, which I'd just like to share with you, which made me think a little bit about how I act in hospitals. The quote is, they may forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. So when you're next on your ward round or giving someone feedback after a long, hard day, just think about that. You've got potential to make somebody feel great or to feel terrible, and that influence can be used to really improve our patient care, and we need to make sure we do that. Having said all that, trainees also need to step up to the mark. We need to realise that we are represent a profession and that we, have, we are not the juniors, but we are doctors in our own right and have to do that. We complain about a hierarchical system, and I'm sure few of you will dispute the fact that medicine is hierarchical. However, it's often the child, or in this case the junior doctor, that may pre um, precipitate the parent-child relationship. And we as trainees need to wake up and take on the responsibility and accountability that comes with being a doctor and a leader, whatever level we are, whether you're foundation year one or an ST8. And I think the involvement of junior doctors in things such as the Keogh Review and the CQC now inspection armies has been liberating and allowing us to do that. You know, as a junior doctor, you know in your patch which are the good and the bad hospitals. We all talk about it together. 
but we're now being recognised as the eyes and the ears of the hospital, as having a really valuable thing to say. And it's not until you sit in those facilitating a junior doctor's focus group that you realise just how perceptive they are. You can tell you exactly where the data pack will say the problems are and where the report ends up being just by asking the junior doctors. We need to use that. And I think we also need to challenge ourselves on why is it that we can get that information from a junior doctor's focus group facilitated by a junior doctor and yet it's not openly said. We have not got a culture where people feel they're able to, um, to raise concerns in an open, honest environment. But there is interest and enthusiasm. This conference today just demonstrates that. Um, we've got over, over 100 people have gone through the National Medical Director Clinical Fellow Scheme. I mean, that is fantastic. Thousands have done leadership and management programs across the country. 50% of the faculty's membership of medical students and trainees. You know, we are up there. We are showing we care. And you just need to look at the amazing posters we've had here um, over this last couple of days to see how much phenomenal work is going on, being led by trainees and actually showing tremendous impact for patients. But we need to find a way to channel and appreciate the um, enthusiasm that we've got. I've taken this year out and I feel that I have gained phenomenal experience in terms of my leadership abilities and yet it's not recognised. It does not count towards my ARCP, it does not count towards my leadership competencies on my portfolio. That's fine, I'm very happy to do this myself, but why are we not recognising this? And I think the work the faculty is doing on developing standards and professionalisation of leadership is actually a really good way to make it that we can be very proud to say and show that it's part of medicine, that leadership is integral. Now, enthusiasm and energy is contagious. Okay, so when we get a smile, everyone gets a smile. So we need to, we need to enhance, capture the enthusiasm and energy from this conference. And what I put to you all today is if you're a trainee, if you're a consultant, if you're a national medical director or CMO, what I want you to do is go and make sure you find at least one trainee, find out their frustrations, find out their problems, but get them to channel that into an improvement, get them to do some good improvement work. And even if it's small, just one thing, if we all do that with one extra person, and then maybe it will propagate, we'll get a much better healthcare system for everyone to work in. So I'd just like to end on one point which um, Peter actually opened with. He mentioned that leadership is an amateur sport. And what I'd like to put to you is, that if we want to go to the Olympics, we need to use the power of the trainees to get there. Thank you. Thank you. So leadership starts on day one, and we need to pyramid sell it to get it into the culture.